generally speaking, my day starts off pretty much the same. Cold. <laughs> well, outside it is, anyways. At least so far. Pretty soon I know that my day will start off and it'll be warm outside. And then it'll get hot. I mean, where I live, it'll get really hot. And I don't mean just hot stuff. <laughs> but the interesting thing about that is that as my morning progresses, you know, I post things and I write things and I read my devotionals. I consider the day that the Lord has made and all the things that there are of I'm enjoying. I find myself having to adapt to the day because it warms up gradually. The same thing is true about you and I. We don't always start off with our best foot forward. Sometimes we need a Pepsi. <laughs> of course, some power drinkers out there going, yeah, give me my, my dew or give me my whatever it is they're using nowadays for power drinks. <laughs> Rockstar donut figure. But knowing that the day is going to change, I change with it. Now, I have sweats on in the morning and I put on a big sweat or yeah, sweats on and I put on a big sweat shirt and I usually have on a black kind of pullback hat because if you cover your head it keeps you warmer. I put on some heavy shoes, sometimes some heavy socks, and sometimes I record out here in the morning, and I'm kind of like, man, whew, it's cold, you know, and it's my office, it's cold. But then, if I left that on all day, like right now, sitting in the sunshine, I'd be sweating. It just wouldn't be the right fit for what's going on at the right time. And that's something that happens in you and I's life. Sometimes you may have the right thing, but you're not the right fit because you're in the wrong place at the right time. You see, we have to always, in all our ways, seek to find the perfect timing and place that God has for us to move into the will of God so that we would do things according to His way. It's easy, I'll tell you, I'm famous for it. It's easy to see something you think you ought to do and go do it without ever asking, without ever checking in or checking out whether it's God's will or not. But then you get in it and you kind of go, well, you know, it just didn't turn out the way I thought it would. Yeah. There's more to life than just simply knowing what's right. There's more to life than just doing what's right. Sometimes there's thing in life called timing. It's kind of like, you know, you get this idea and uh, you think it's really important that you tell everyone about it. So you shoot off your mouth at the wrong time. And guess what happens? Nobody accepts what you have to say. But then down the road, you kind of watch and you see, and you know what? Someone else says it and they go, and they think that it's wonderful. And yet you said the same thing. What's up with that? It's called timing. You see, a lot of what we do is in the Lord's timing as well as in His will and His way. Because God may tell you something that's going to happen, but not yet. It's not time yet. Sometimes people do that with prophecy. Sometimes people do that with a word they've been given. You know, like, well, you know, God said He'd protect me, so you know, I'm going to run out and, you know, start a war, you know, see if he'll protect me. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. That's just stupid. And doing stupid things will still get you stupid results. Quite frankly, that's just being stupid. But when you do things right and you can't figure out what's wrong, then let me present to you that possibility about timing. Because you could be right, so don't doubt what you're doing. You could have the right idea, the right scripture, the right word. You might have the right ministry. You might have the right answer. But God might want you to not use that yet, but to wait on him, to 
be patient for his timing because when it's his purpose to be accomplished he has a timing that's completely opposite of ours we think as soon as there's a need we got to meet that need you know drive through restaurant kind of idea you know as soon as I'm hungry I got to go fulfill my hunger no you don't as a matter of fact I can tell you this based upon my mother my mother was a wonderful woman uh, more or less <laughs> she's a truck stop waitress so you know you got to kind of play that one off she had a wicked sense of humor and she was the best mother a father could be you know? <laughs> or the best father a mother could be she had to do both so she's kind of like you know mixed up and messed up but that's the way it was and I enjoyed her she was a good person so to speak meaning that she had the right attitude she had the right idea her life was going the wrong direction until finally she got it going in the right direction and she died in faith and of the faith and so she went home to be with Jesus but one of the things I was impressed with her was her timing you know, her timing was always interesting is that she always had the right word at the right time sarcastically but it was funny you know it's kind of like one of those biting humor things but boy could she deliver you could call it timing and one of the things about her timing was also about food you know she had an interesting way of teaching us to eat what was on our plate now when we grew up we rebelled completely against what she was doing you know we quit eating period she quit cooking and just sent us out to drive throughs you know so we just ate drive through restaurant you know one person would eat from Del Taco another person would eat from McDonald's another person from Kentucky Fried you know I mean it was kind of one of those things thinking of my sisters just now and so one of the things about when we were younger though the timing wise was that we would sit down at a table which was rare but you know in her earlier days she tried to do that especially me being the oldest I remember those days my sisters have a hard time remembering some of those days but sit down at the table and she'd say if you're hungry enough you'll eat it and you know what I learned that lesson in my older life by developing a timing when I'm hungry I don't go eat right away I wait you know I just I wait and you know I get this idea of what I want you know I kind of think man you know burger sounds good but then I wait because if I'm gonna go get a burger I'm probably gonna get gas too so it's like ooh I don't want gas put a burger on top of whatever and it's gonna make gas matter of fact sometimes just a burger by itself will make gas depends on how old you are and what kind of metabolism you have but I'll be thinking about a burger you know and I'll go man you know I'll wait you know when I first feel hungry I'll wait an hour maybe even two hours and gradually the hungrier I get by the time I get that burger oh my god it tastes so good Ooh, man it's like I can see it now I'm already thinking of a burger we just found a new one you know it's kind of like Carl's Jr. you know it's got this kind of like a bourbon burger or something you know and it's like not kosher <laughs> who cares <laughs> I don't do kosher but the point is it's kosher for me it's kosher for you but the point is the bourbon burger oh man because we've been broke we haven't been able to eat out you know even in cheap restaurants much less you know drive throughs so you know we don't eat out at all and when we do we eat very cheap you know and we have to use the coupons but man you know the other day when we had one after not eating for two weeks any burgers wow man it was good I was like oh man this is so good and that's what timing does for you sometimes the Lord's timing will make you appreciate something a whole lot more than if you had it as soon as you wanted it or if you got it as soon as you thought about it because God wants you to not only appreciate but to enjoy the abundance that he's given you in, in your life as well as in mine he wants us to employ that appreciation factor by way of disciplining ourselves to trust in his timing and not our own a lot of times that's something that has to be learned through age because we're not always the most patient of people and James you know if you took a turn in the book of James today you'll read it about how patience is produced most people hate that way of looking at it 
Me, I kind of like it. I like the fact that James wants me to learn patience and that trials and tribulations will cause those things so that I could be fully equipped so I get a great benefit out of learning that lesson that James talks about. But you know, timing always seems to fit right in the place where God wants it to be, right in the way God wants to do it and fulfills the need that God sees somewhere at some place because of his ability to know the beginning from the end. So his timing is always perfect. His ways are not our ways, obviously. His thoughts are our thoughts. And matter of fact, there's not much about him that's like us except for we're created in his image. You know, he imagined it and so we are. <laughs> That's about as close to the image as we get. <laughs> okay, maybe body, soul, and spirit, you know, kind of, you know, three in one. But the bottom line is, knowing the Lord's timing, you have to know the Lord. You have to ask Him, because to everything there is a season and a time to be born, a time to die, a time to reap, a time to sow, a time for crying, a time for weeping, a time for rejoicing, a time for sadness, a time for gladness, a time for everything. So, really, it would behoove you, which means that it would just be a great benefit to you, if you would examine if you're right, which is okay, and you find out you're right, then examine if you're doing right, which is okay, then examine if it's the Lord's timing, so that you know that you're doing it when He wants to, not just what He wants to, or who He wants you to maybe do what He wants you to do that you're doing. What I tell you in darkness, speak you in the light. Our Lord is constantly taking us into the dark that he may tell us things. Into the dark of the shadowed home where bereavement has drawn the blinds. Into the dark of the lonely, desolate life where some infirmity closes in from the light and stir of life. Into the dark are some crushing sorrow and disappointment. Then he tells us his secrets, great and wonderful, eternal and infinite. He causes the eye which has become dazzled by the glare of the earth to behold the heavenly constellations and the ear to detect the undertones of his voice which is often drowned amid the tumult of earth's strident cries. But such revelations always imply a corresponding responsibility. That speak ye in the light, that proclaim upon the housetops. What I tell you in darkness, speak ye in the light. We are not meant to always linger in the dark or to stay in the closet. Presently we shall be summoned to take our place in the rush and storm of life. And when that moment comes, we are to speak and proclaim what we have learned. That gives new meaning to suffering, the saddest element in which is often its apparent aimlessness. Oh, how useless I am! What am I doing for the betterment of man? Or for this waste of such precious spikenard on my soul? Such are the desperate laments of the sufferer. But God has a purpose in it all. He has withdrawn his child to the higher altitudes of fellowship, that he may hear God speak to him face to face and bear the message to his fellow men at the foot of the mountain. When the forty days were the forty days wasted that Moses spent on the mountaintop, or that period spent in Horeb by Elijah, or the years spent in Arabia by Paul, there is no shortcut to the life of faith, which is the all-vital condition of a holy and victorious life. We must have periods of very lonely meditation and fellowship with God, alone with Him, that our souls should have their mountains of fellowship, the valley of quiet rest beneath the shadow of the great rock, their nights beneath the, human, beneath the stars when darkness has veiled the material and silence the stir of human life, has opened the view of the infinite and internal is as indispensable as that our body should have food. It is one of the most important things that you ever will do or go through. Thus alone can the sense of God's presence become the fixed possession of the soul, enabling it to say repeatedly with the psalmist, Thou art near, O God. Let it be such that God takes you to that place in his will, in his way, in his purpose, in his timing, in his choices for you. That maybe you might step away at times and be brought away to come away with him, your beloved. That you might be still and know that he's God. But then when the timing's right, 
you will go back and proclaim from the housetops all that God has brought you through, all that God has done to you and with you. Because I've been there. I know what it's like to be shelved or set aside, to be put in a place where God's going to speak to you directly through the suffering and in the suffering and with the suffering, where God's going to develop in you some good graces that you'll be able to share with others the same comfort with which you were comforted, the same words with which he spoke to you, you'll speak to others, the same ministry that he's given to you, speaking to you face to face, you'll speak to others face to face in the same way that Jesus did for you, with you, and to you. Just wait. It won't be long. And when it's time, you'll know. Just don't be in a hurry. Don't rush forward when God always walks to where he's going.